Adner. I'm a member of the program committee of the Charlotte Hobbs Memorial mm -hmm. Library and um, on behalf of, of the library, I welcome you to the May installment of our speaker series and we are very grateful that it is generously partially supported by a grant from the Norway Savings Bank. I want to tell you also before we get started that we have a June program coming up on June 16th, the author of the wonderful novel Beneficence. Um, and um, and the uh, earlier memoir, um, um, <clears throat> uh, will be our speaker on June sixteenth, and you'll find that information also on the library website. And we also have our annual meeting coming up on June twenty second. So <clears throat> please join us for all of those things. It's going to be a very busy month. Um, but right now I want to welcome you to our May talk and I want to ask you to keep your, your um, <clears throat> excuse me, to keep, to keep your microphones muted during the talk. Uh, but then afterwards we will have plenty of time for questions and discussion. If something comes to you during the talk as you're listening, uh, jot it down in the chat and we'll take those questions later or you can just wave your hand wildly and we'll call on you uh, after the talk and we'll see where the discussion takes us because this could go wild and wonderful. Um, I get to introduce Sue Lancer. Uh, many of you will not need that. Uh, she is very well known in Lovell, especially from people in the library where she has led the Page Turners book group for years. Um, she's a former president of the library board and she's currently a member of the steering committee of the Friends of the Library. She's um, a professor emerita of Brandeis University. She lives in Lovell and Cambridge and she is the most relentless, relentlessly active retiree I have ever seen, frankly. Um, she is an internationally known scholar. She has published books and articles on comparative literature, sexuality studies, 18th century history and literature, women's history, feminist theory, the formal elements of Palestinian and Israeli narratives. Uh, many of those things have won awards, as has she. She received the Wayne Booth Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society of the Study of Narrative. And for all that, she is human. And what I want to say about that is that um, I, I think she has a habit that many of us do have. Do you have a topic that catches your attention? You know, something that when you see it, you have to follow it out, whether it's, you know, hammered dulcimer music or planting irises or whatever it happens to be. Sue Lancer has one of those. Her topic of absorption is the French Revolution. It has been for years. And I asked her why, and the first thing she said was, they had such a passionate insistence on liberty. And then she said, at a cost, there was a hard cost. And then she said, but the world, the world was transformed. And I love that vision. And I love the fact that her talk tonight brings together improbably the two topics that she does both love, Maine and the French Revolution. So please welcome Sue Lancer to talk to us about Marie Antoinette in Maine. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, you were cutting out a little bit, so I tested your internet, um, but um, not much. So thank you all. Thank you for being here, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Joe. Um, I am a French Revolution junkie, as I have sometimes called myself. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you a lot of slides. And don't worry if you can't read everything on them. They're going to kind of flash. So think of it as a sort of 
um, visual accompaniment to my talk, but don't worry about things that you don't have time to read. Um, you'll get orally the, the kind of basics. Okay, so I hope that will work. So let's make sure I can share the screen. Um, okay, can you see it? Everybody see it okay? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna, this talk is, is read because otherwise I would get only halfway through it with all my ad libs and it would be too long. Uh, so here we go. So at the center of this story is a house and you'll see the house in a minute. It perches high above the Sheepscot River at 147 Eddy Road in North Edgecombe, Maine, across the water from Wiscasset. It's still called the Marie Antoinette House today, though it was moved to its present location in 1838. So I'm showing you both sites there. Um, and it has figured for over two centuries as the evidence of a supposed plot in which a sea captain named Stephen Clough would spring the queen from prison and spirit her to safety in Maine. Whether the plot was a failure or only a fiction, its long life raises questions about its time and our own, evoking the entangled troubles of two fledgling republics, the emergence of an American obsession with the queen and New England's image of itself. So a little background. Marie, whoops, there's the house. Whoops, I forgot to move my slide. So now you can see the house. It's a quite a plain house. It doesn't look like Versailles. Plain Georgian house. So here's a little background. Maria Antonia, Marie Antoinette, was born in 1755. She was the 11th child of the Austrian Empress Maria Theresa. And she was married off at the age of 13 to the Dauphin of France, the heir to the throne, who became King Louis XVI in 1774 when he was not quite 20 and she was not quite 19. By the mid 1780s, the queen had given birth to four children and lost two of them at the ages of one and eight in 1787 and 1789 respectively. Though images of motherhood somewhat softened public opinion, by the eve of the French Revolution, the Austrian born Queen of France had become a controversial figure, denounced for conspicuous consumption, political meddling and sexual licentiousness. In 1785, a plot known as the Diamond Necklace Affair in which the queen was entrapped particularly outraged the public, which never believed that the queen was in fact innocent in that plot. For sure, the queen was self-absorbed and insouciant, although she never said, let them eat cake, I promise you. But she also became a symbol that far exceeded any power she actually had. On the queen's body were heaped all the ills of the ancien regime, the old regime. This is a typical caricature of Marie Antoinette. The word autriche and the word autruche are very, they sound alike. One means Austrian and one means ostrich. So there's a lot of images of Marie Antoinette as an ostrich. So it's no surprise that the French Revolution wanted her head. During the tumultuous October days of 1789, working women marched the 12 miles to Versailles, threatened the queen and the royal household and escorted them back to Paris. In 1791, the family tried to escape, but were spotted near the border town of Varennes and brought back again. A year later, in August 1792, the palace guards were routed in a bloody battle, a republic was declared, and the royal family was imprisoned. This is an image of the temple, the temple, where they were imprisoned in 1792. In January 1793, the National Assembly of France found the deposed king guilty of treason and voted by a slender margin for his death. His widow and children remained imprisoned, but then in August 1793, Marie Antoinette, reviled by the populace and distrusted by the politicians, was moved to the conciergerie, another prison, the guillotine's infamous waiting room. A month into the official reign of terror, Marie Antoinette was brought to trial and uh, she was accused not only of treason, but of a completely trumped up charge 
which was particularly offensive to her of incestuous relations with her eight-year-old son. The predetermined execution took place just a few hours after the verdict on October 16, 1793, and with brutally degrading display, the queen now known as the widow Capet was born in an open cart, her hands bound, sitting backward before a jeering crowd and by eyewitness accounts aged almost beyond recognition, her features sunken, her shorn hair white, in effect, as memorialized in the picture on your right by Jacques-Louis David, she seemed already dead. Against this dramatic fall from riches to rags, we can count a host of real and imagined efforts to save the queen. During the summer of 1793, at least three plots were planned and foiled, the most famous being the so-called carnation plot, which involved a note concealed in a flower, and yes, they were caught. None of these verified plots involves Americans. And to our modern imagination, the phrase Marie Antoinette in Maine may well conjure the odd image of a gilded lily in a stand of pines. But the idea was not at all outlandish in 1793. As early as 1790, the American minister to France had already looked for ways to bring the royal family to America, along with the many French emigres most of them nobility who did find asylum here. And when Tom Paine as a member of the French National Assembly opposed the execution of the king, he too proposed exile to the United States as an alternative. The idea was gonna be that, that the king would become a gentleman farmer in Pennsylvania. That was actually what they were hoping for. After all, the United States was still in debt to the royal family figuratively and literally for supporting the War of Independence from Britain. And Massachusetts had already welcomed thousands of French Protestants fleeing persecution a century earlier. Paul Revere's family name was, you may not know this, originally Rivoire. He was Franco-American. And Bowdoin College was endowed by one James Baudouin. Moreover, Wiscasset, Maine was a bustling seaport in the 1790s, and its hardiest commercial connections were with France, which depended on its lumber for spar and its foodstuffs for sustenance. Maine was not the only American site rumored to have planned for the Queen's rescue. Here's our map of Maine in 1820, I uh, in 1794, uh, I'm sorry. And I remind you that Maine was part of Massachusetts at that point, right? But a royal refuge was also planned supposedly in rural Pennsylvania where French emigres had established an experimental community they fittingly called asylum, meaning asylum. There the queen would be installed in the largest log house in America three stories high, 84 feet long, and 60 feet wide. I guess as close to Versailles as you could make a log cabin. It would have French windows and eight fireplaces. But there is no evidence that the Asylum emigres ever attempted to have the queen released. And in any case, the plan became moot before the house was completed. Asylum itself was abandoned within a decade, but its story lives on and you can visit the site today and Zoe Troutman, I think, is online with us and knows about Azilam and I think has visited us, visited us it so she can tell us about it as well, perhaps. So a rescue to French Azilam is more plausible than the Queen's retirement to a sea captain's cottage in coastal Maine, but it's the main story that has held popular sway. I first encountered it a few decades ago in a secondhand bookstore when I happened on a truly dreadful novel by one Nat Wilder Jr. published in 1910 and entitled A Royal Tragedy When Kings and Savages Ruled. We'll come back to that title. The novel claims to be based on letters and manuscripts found in an old trunk. There is no evidence that any such trunk ever existed, nor have any 18th century letters or manuscripts surfaced that confirm even the barest outlines of the tale. Yet that absence of evidence has not held back a stream of story about Marie Antoinette in Maine that reached print in the late 19th century and still has not run dry. 
The core of the story centers on two men, one family, and the house. There it is again. The men are that Wiscasset Sea Captain Stephen Clough, and the other man is a quixotic Boston financier named James Swan. Commercial records confirm that Clough, acting as Swan's agent, sailed his ship the Sally to France in 1793 and returned with a load of fine furniture and elegant household goods. Maine historian Janet Carper, to whose careful work I am deeply indebted, discovered a register of foreigners in France that does put Stephen Clough in the port of Le Havre, 200 kilometers from Paris, three days before the queen's death. As the legend would have it, that ship was planning a rescue of the queen, legend. All we know for sure is that Swan got those elegant French furnishings loaded on the ship, most of which were sold and some of which now reside in a dedicated gallery in Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. I'll show you a few pictures later. And Clough got the credit for supposedly preparing a queenly refuge in his own home. But the only evidence for the plot itself comes from the Clough family tradition on which Stephen Clough's descendants at, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century insisted ferociously and which 19th century historians affirmed on the grounds of the family's highest respectability. If there was a rescue plot, however, no one seems to have noticed it for a full hundred years. I have found no account that dates before 1893 not incidentally the centennial of the Queen's death. The first published story appeared in the Boston Herald in September, 1893, followed by an account in the Bangor Daily Whig, that's on the right side here, in October, and then a scholarly lecture in December to the Maine Historical Society by Bowdoin graduate lawyer and amateur historian, Rufus King Sewell, who by that point lived in Wiscasset. Thereafter, we can track a stream of publication that um, about the alleged plot in regional magazines and in newspapers all over the United States, from Georgia to Chicago to Kansas. And we can see versions and versions of this plot today in the blogosphere. But these accounts are far from consistent. Some features, um, some feature inside help from famous people like the Marquis de Lafayette. Others feature inside help from other people. And the Marquis de Lafayette at that time was in exile and could not possibly have taken part. Some describe the ship Sally waiting anxiously. Um, sorry, some describe the ship Sally waiting anxiously for the queen at the 11th hour and then sailing for Maine in the nick of time under the fear of French pursuit. Several accounts claim that Captain Clough brought back clothing belonging to the queen, from which his wife then made either dresses for her daughters or a robe for her husband. Some claim that Clough returned with King Louis's judicial robes. And some claim that the family still possessed a bloodstained relic of the dress she wore to her execution. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is really fun. New versions continue. If you Google Maine Coon Cat, you will see claims that the breed descended from Marie Antoinette's long-haired Persians, allegedly sent to Wiscasset aboard Captain Clough's ship to provide solace in the queen's new home. You can see why the story was contested from the start. All of these divergent versions are back formations from the 1890s, not the 1790s, which puts the whole burden of evidence on oral tradition. Even the absence of written evidence of the plot, however, has been offered as evidence to the question of why there is no evidence in the Clough family papers. The press retorted that Clough's granddaughter, Sarah Chase, was so tired of answering questions about the plot that she took a rowboat into the middle of the Sheepscut River and dumped the family correspondence overboard. So is this plot a historical reality or fake news? Certainly the question of veracity was raised from the outset. You can see here an exchange in an 1896 magazine, in, and don't worry about reading every word, 
in which a descendant of Clough claims to possess a light colored piece of satin from the gown the queen allegedly wore to her execution. You can also see the skeptical editor replying that the queen was wearing a simple gown of white, not satin, when she died. The editor goes on to say that with all due respect to the family, the evidence laid out does not suffice. We can also ask why, if there really was a plan, was the story so silent for a century? And if there never was a plan, why did the story hit the press in 1893 and surface repeatedly? I can only offer speculative evidence. Here's one of the gory uh, newspaper versions. I can only offer speculative evidence, of course, since proving something that didn't happen is always tricky and always provisional. Perhaps someday we will discover that it did. But we can start by asking whether Stephen Clough and James Swan would have been likely to attempt such a rescue in the first place. And that requires a look at the political circumstances of October 1793. This was a particularly troubled time for the young United States, which was struggling to keep the union together and variously inspired or shaken by the more radical revolution in France. If you're a fan of Hamilton, you know a bit about the tensions between politicians like Alexander Hamilton or John Adams, who would soon be called Federalists, and those like Jefferson and Madison, who would soon be called Democratic Republicans or just Democrats. Uh, don't, these are not the same as our parties today, of course. This rivalry had everything to do with events abroad. France and England were at war, and an already divided America was teetering between two very different concepts of governance, epitomized by monarchical England and Republican France. Federalists accused Republicans of fomenting anarchy and sought to curtail criticism of the government for fear that the fledgling union would not hold. Republicans accused Federalists of wanting to turn the president into a king, John Adams had proposed in 1789 that George Washington be addressed as his highness. And Republicans said that Federalists were trying to curtail the very freedoms for which the War of Independence had been fought. As Susan Dunn comments, each group portrayed its opponent as conspiratorial and treasonous, an ally either of reactionary England or of sanguinary France. Both factions charge the other for scheming to subvert America's autonomy and its Republican ideals. So if you wonder where the polarization in this country comes from, it started then. This is, this is the beginning of, I would say, the kind of uh, two-party polarization that we see today. No wonder reports from an ever-changing France were more abundant and more prominent in the US press than any other foreign or even domestic news. Everyone followed what was happening to a revolution that the United States had inspired in a country that had helped it gain its own freedom. Of course, that news took two or three months to cross the ocean. So the United States was never responding to events in the moment when they occurred. In this climate as politically divisive as our own and for somewhat related reasons, Federalists and Republicans were also divided in their opinions of Marie Antoinette. John Adams had found her charming, Jefferson found her capricious. Adams feared that the Queen's execution would exacerbate tensions in the United States. He wrote, the news of this evening is that the Queen of France is no more, no prospect of peace in Europe, and therefore none of internal harmony in America. Jefferson, in contrast, maintained that monarchs should be amenable to punishment like other criminals, and that the queen, I quote, led herself to the guillotine and drew the king on with her and plunged the world into crimes and calamities. I have ever believed that had there been no queen, there would have been no revolution. We can see that same divergence of viewpoints in the press, which in the 1790s and beyond was openly partisan. Pro-Federalist newspapers saw Marie Antoinette as a tragic figure, a woman so highly born and so lowly fallen, as one poet puts it. The, these accounts emphasize her dignity in the face of false accusations, her calm march to the scaffold, and her alleged apology to the executioner when she mistakenly stepped on his foot. 
Federalist papers poured out laments for the queen, theatrical tragedies and saintly narratives of her last days. The Democratic Republican press by contrast, and this is a French example of, of that idea, stuck with unsentimental and unvarnished facts. They simply said the trial of Maria Antoinette lasted for three days, she was found guilty, she was condemned to death, and she was executed. Anti-monarchic sentiment was still high in the United States, however, even in 1795, the Democratic Philadelphia paper American Aurora toasted Independence Day that year by hoping that all despots would merit the fate of Louis XVI, amen, three cheers. So we have a very divided country with obviously divided attitudes toward Marie Antoinette as well. There would have been plenty of Federalist sympathy in New England in 1793 to welcome the deposed queen, who was often given more than her fair share of credit for supporting the American War of Independence. And other famous French emigres, like the diplomat Talleyrand, or even Louis-Philippe, who would become King of France in 1830, had received a welcome in Maine around that time and were said to have visited Wiscasset. But Wiscasset also seems to have had democratic Republican leanings by that time, not Federalist ones. Maine's first district sent the, I mean, Massachusetts first district, which is the district of Maine, sent the Democratic Republican Henry Dearborn to Congress in 1794 with a whopping 64% of the vote, the highest percentage for any non-Federalist candidate in Massachusetts. Moreover, the head of Wiscasset Salt Works was rumored to be spying for France, which meant that bringing the queen to Wiscasset could have been tricky business. Once we focus on the two principals, Clough and his employer, James Swan, the logic of rescue becomes even more strained. It's hard to know Stephen Clough's political affiliations in 1793, but trade with France underwrote both Wiscasset's prosperity and Clough's. So unless there was some deal for compensation, it's hard to imagine that he would have jeopardized his French connections to save the queen. Records show Clough sailing to France again in the fall of 1794, commanding a ship called the Success and returning home on April 6, 1795 after a speedy 46 days at sea. He was clearly neither barred from nor reluctant to enter France as a perceived royalist would have been. Those who believe the plot point to the fact that Clough named his youngest daughter Hannah Antoinette in 1798. But at that point, American regard for the current French government was so low as to make an alliance with the old regime seem almost appealing. And Clough was at that point no longer sailing to France. So the case for Clough as the Queen's rescuer is equivocal at best. The case for James Swan is weaker still on both political and economic grounds. Swan went to France in 1787 to rebuild his fortune, attempted to ingratiate himself with highly placed American dignitaries such as Jefferson and produced a plan for improving trade between America and France. His commercial projects survived changing French regimes and in the very month of the Queen's trial, he had secured a niche for himself as an advisor to the French Convention's newly created Commission of Subsistence. As a wizard of commercial shipping, Swan devised ways for France to trade, not only with its friends, but undercover with its foes. He was trusted as well by the American government, which authorized him to negotiate the repayment of its own Revolutionary War debt to France. Swan also stood notably on principle in his support for radical politics. Having emigrated to Boston from Scotland as a boy, he joined the Boston Tea Party, wrote an early treatise for abolition against slavery, and spent his last years living in luxury in the debtor's prison of Saint-Pelagie in France for a claim he could easily have settled, but insisted he did not owe. Boston newspapers attest to his forcefully expressed Republican politics, which would make it unlikely for him to want to save the queen. But above all, Swan was an economic um, opportunist on the lookout for profit, whether it's for his country or for himself. 
It seems far-fetched to imagine that someone so rapacious would jeopardize his strong relationship with the French government by engaging in a rescue that was almost sure to fail. If there was never a real rescue plot, then from what threads was it invented? Why was it passed down? And why did it surface a century later and persist in so many American newspapers in so many dramatic versions? My proposed answer lies less in the politics of French Revolution than in an economically driven new America's understanding of itself. As I noted earlier, Stephen Clough's ship sailed to France with lumber and foodstuffs and returned with furniture, clothing, and decorative arts. Romantic accounts of those luxuries usually have Clough loading his ship with the queen's own possessions in preparation in, prepar sorry, in preparation for her life in Maine or with the belongings of emigres who entrusted them to Clough or to Swan before fleeing or who were executed before they could flee. The problem with this accounting is that by October 1793, most emigres were long gone and their remaining goods would already have been confiscated by the state. France was broke and what it had to offer in foreign trade, besides gold melted from appropriated religious objects, were luxuries shunned by French Republicans. A two-day sale held at Versailles in August 1793 dispensed with the remainder of Marie Antoinette's belongings, including suites of furniture, writing desks, consoles with marble tops, damask and velvet covered chairs, glass and china for both pantry and parlor use. And it was made clear that these objects could be transported duty-free to foreign parts. Swan himself helped to sell such goods to several countries as a way for France to acquire desperately needed raw materials. And he became the sole agent authorized to export them to the United States. Indeed, the British diplomat Francis Drake quipped of his behavior toward the belongings of the French elite, that is Swan's behavior, that between Madame Guillotine who took off their heads and Swan who took off their trunks, there was very little left of the unfortunate Frenchman. It was Stephen Clough, however, and not James Swan who ferried back those trunks. And so we might consider the probable reception of these luxury goods in Wiscasset. Elite Boston might have welcomed Swan's treasures as Philadelphia had welcomed in 1789, Thomas Jefferson's 86 packing crates of elegant goods from France. I have found accounts of Swan's wife Hepzibah enjoying French champagne in her Dorchester mansion, which was also dubbed a Marie Antoinette house, though most likely only for its furnishings. But at the time, even Boston was steeped in tradition and suspicious of luxury. Luxury goods would have played even less well in the countryside. As one popular work of 1794 put it, the fashions of Europe, especially of Britain and France, suit neither the climate, the convenience, the policy, the property, nor the character of this country. It seems plausible that the plot could have afforded the Cloughs a more palatable account of the Sally's cargo than the clear reality that Clough and Swan intended to sell these goods to wealthy Americans. The family liked to claim, for example, that although Stephen Clough brought home a satin gown that Louis XVI wore for legal proceedings, Clough's frugal wife cut it up to make dresses for herself and a child. In other words, the romance of rescue might have made a better story than the opportunistic economic exchange that actually underwrote the Sally's voyage. The new nation was already notorious in its passion for becoming rich, as the popular poem Greenfield Hills puts it. The new, in the New America, the poem says, business reigns as the universal queen. The rescue plot might have whitewashed the extent to which America was ready to turn the queen's misfortunes into cash. Newspaper accounts of the plot emphasize benevolence over profit, describing Stephen Clough as, whoops, sorry, a big hearted American whose real purpose was to aid the victims of revolutionary vengeance. 
a Stephen Clough who reluctantly set sail with just the goods and not their owners, and who kept his royal luxuries not for gain, but merely to reimburse himself for his risk and expense. Is this not the kind of story Americans still like to tell ourselves about our business dealings? A 2018 of account of the plot even advances the fiction that the goods Clough transported were not sold at all, but rather distributed among the Americans who had supported the plan. That is the plan to rescue Marie Antoinette. It's also understandable that Wiscasset would welcome the claim to fame. As Fanny Chase only partly exaggerates in her history of the town, I'm gonna, I think my slides are messed up. So I'm gonna show you this first. Um, these are some of the objects that were brought back by James Wan. And by the way, Stephen Clough did not benefit. Um, Stephen Clough was working for James Wan. It was really James Wan who benefited from uh, the hefty sale of these goods. It's also understandable, as I was saying, that Wiscasset would welcome the claim to fame. As Fanny Chase only partly exaggerates in her history of the town, after the American Revolution, everybody flocked to Wiscasset to share in its remarkable success. But the embargo on foreign trade imposed by Congress in 1807, ostensibly to punish France and Britain, would decimate Wiscasset. Chase laments Wiscasset's sad decline from her former glory during those gloomy days when a ship owner could sit in his window and see his own ships rotting at the wharfs. You see that, oh, grab me in the upper left corner. That is embargo spelled backwards. So this is a political cartoon against the embargo that was really hurting um, American uh, ship merchants. Uh, although it was making a political point for the United States. And you can see at the bottom here uh, that Stephen Clough in 1807 is selling his brig, the brig that he owned at that time. Clough was already encountering financial trouble by 1803. And after the embargo, he was reduced to domestic river trade. He died on the Mississippi near Alabama in 1818. So the rescue plot also recalls both the Clough families and Wiscasset's better days. Framing the town as the site of rescue gives it an enduring place, not just in local, but in global history. No wonder the story was passed down through the generations and no wonder the Washington Post calls it in 1900, a pretty story with all the parts nicely fitted a phrase that should be an obvious red flag. The sticking power of Marie Antoinette in Maine in its local setting is revealing in itself, but its national eruption a century after the queen's execution might tell a further tale. American interest in Marie Antoinette between 1800 and 1870 was minimal. That does not mean there was no taste for royalty. By 1838, a Victoria fever swept the country it's in fascination with the 18 year old who had unexpectedly become England's reigning queen. It's not until the 1870s and 1880s that Marie Antoinette returns to public interest, surfacing in the society columns of um, as far west as in papers as far west as Colorado, though mostly in ways that reduce the queen to clothing. Marie Antoinette corsages, Marie Antoinette collars, Marie Antoinette gowns. Within a decade, there would also be an elegant Marie Antoinette hotel at 67th and Broadway and a Marie Antoinette parlor in the new Waldorf Astoria. This was the Gilded Age when American wealth skyrocketed and the American wealthy aspired to all things continental. But the newly popular story, there's your Waldorf, uh, here's your um, Marie Antoinette hotel. The newly popular story of the Queen's rescue also may be involved in more disturbing work. The rescue plot was among the first centennial remembrances of the Queen's death, and it connected the United States. I'm sorry, am I misreading something? Did I just misread? I just misread the same page. I'm sorry. Hold on. Okay. One second while I figure out how I screwed up. 
Okay, but the newly popular story of the Queen's rescue attempt may also be involved in more disturbing work. The rescue plot was among the first centennial remembrances of the Queen's death, and it connected the United States to the fashionable European continent with which the United States was now enthralled. It gave the Queen a kind of cosmopolitan American identity. A 1926 account from Chicago bears the proud headline, American plan to save ill-fated queen. The queen's alleged furnishings tracked in newspaper accounts through their ownership by illustrious New Englanders such as Henry Knox and James Baxter added to the appeal. But I want to return to that execrable, execrable novel, it's really a terrible novel, a royal tragedy to open a question about one more form of cultural work to which the American fancy for the queen may have contributed. In that novel, the whiteness of the Clough family and the royal family is juxtaposed to the darkness of the red-skinned savages who are also said to blacken their bodies for battle and who are likened to the savages of the Parisian working class. In the racial reversals that shape the novel, white English settlers are made into the slaves and prisoners of indigenous people, just as the queen is made a prisoner of the Jacobins. In that way, both the queen and the French Revolution are racialized, and we are reminded that the Gilded Age is also the age of Jim Crow. The Marie Antoinette story hit the American press just when Southern states were passing caste laws and Northern states instantiating de facto segregation upheld in 1896 by Plessy v. Ferguson. The stage was well set for the hysteria that would sweep the country in the wake of D.W. Griffith's wildly popular and blatantly racist film, The Birth of a Nation. It is thus worth asking to what extent the revival of a plot to rescue Marie Antoinette was one more way for the country to sustain its investment in whiteness. Griffith, by the way, also made a film about the French Revolution in 1921. It was called Orphans of the Storm. It starred Lillian Gish. And its message really is that the good French people were the aristocrats. Certainly images of whiteness surround representations of Marie Antoinette. We can think back to Edmund Burke's famous memory of her as glittering like the morning star, or recall portraits ranging from Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun's controversial Marie Antoinette on chemise, it's like her undergarments of 1783, or the 1792 portrait, or the representations of the queen at her trial where she actually wore black was, but is depicted as wearing white, and clearly that's an attempt also to show her as innocent. We can note the, the queen's supposed preference for simple white dresses or comments about the dazzling whiteness of her complexion. We can fast forward to the exaggerated whiteness of Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette in film. And in the novel A Royal Tragedy, the rescuer of the queen is not Captain Clough, but his daughter, Sally, same name as the ship, right? The white maiden, as she is called, who also fights off Indians to save English white men before she fights off the French to save the queen. We might then think about the ways in which the obsession with Marie Antoinette could be playing what Claudia Rankin calls the white card in the racial imaginary of the United States. The Marie Antoinette House still stands on the banks of the Sheepscot, the only edifice in the United States that still carries the queen's name. And its popular attachment to the plot remains robust. You can find it everywhere on the internet. Wiscasset is no longer a major shipping port, but it is certainly a major tourist site for vacationers en route to Booth Bay Harbor or Acadia National Park, which by the way, was originally named for the Marquis de Lafayette. Wiscasset's most famous attraction is not the Marie Antoinette House, which is private and hard to find, but as many of you know, it's Red's Eats, where people line up from noon to night for lobster rolls. Assertions of the plot bearing both shopworn claims and innovative revisions continue to surface, even from websites as official sounding as the New England Historical Society, 
with its National Enquirer type headlines. Let them eat lobster. Marie Antoinette plans to move to Maine. We are far indeed from documented or documentable history. Through it all, serious historians of Maine, from Fanny Chase to Janet Carper, have remained staunchly skeptical. Wiscasset archivist Jane Tucker, whose family owns a Marie Antoinette chair alleged to have come on Clough's ship, laments the continued haunting of the Wiscasset Public Library by writers who for three and more decades have come to us, I'm quoting, for information from our archives that would enable them to write another account for another magazine, but to prove nothing. Almost certainly Marie Antoinette in Maine is a fiction of history, but I hope you'll agree that it's a fiction that illuminates history in resonant and revealing ways. Thank you. Okay, I've stopped my screen and I will take questions and objections and comments of all kinds. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, anyone who would like to ask a question, you can either um, click on reactions at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand on the screen, which will call attention to it, or you can wave your hand in the old fashioned way. Uh, but please unmute yourself and let's have some responses to this extraordinary account. Sort of gave you an awful lot at once, I know. <clears throat> I think it's Rosie, well, Rosie and Miriam, I think both have hands. Oh, okay, good. Yes. Rosie, Rosie. and then Miriam. Oops. Well, well, th thank you very much, Sue. That was most interesting. Um, and I guess I'm amazed that people are still believing it. Are you? Am I believing it? No, are you surprised people oh. are still trying to believe it? Well, I am and I'm not. And I think I, I'm, I'm surprised that, I'm very surprised it ever surfaced in the first place. Ah. You know, so that's number one. I'm surprised that it went viral at the turn of the 20th century. That's surprise number two. Um, I'm not surprised that it's still there because I think it reflects so many different kinds of investments that people have both in Marie Antoinette and in claiming a certain kind of um, story for Maine. Uh, and I think both of those things are operating here. Um, I think we can ask a lot of questions about this fascination with Marie Antoinette that is a, an obsession that is certainly national in this country and I would say international. So I'd like to be more surprised, Rosie. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. Miriam, unmute yourself and speak up. I was just wondering if there were pictures anywhere of the dresses that were made from Marie Antoinette, if they really were. Was that Swan's wife or Clough's wife that supposedly made the dresses for her kids? Right. Um, it's Clough's wife who supposedly made the dresses. And the by the time we're told about the dresses, it is in the 20th century. Oh, they're all. And so we've got descendants saying, you know, I heard about this. I heard about this. And then we have this man writing. Um, I showed you that one long account uh, who is a descendant. He lives in Minnesota and he's writing that he has a piece of satin and he has been told that that piece of satin comes from the dress Marie Antoinette wore to her execution. Uh, he does not say a bloodstained satin. Some, pe some of the stories say that there was something stained with her blood from her guillotining. So, you know, there are various versions, but there is nothing for a hundred years. Um, I am gonna keep at looking for looking for something. And Nina, if if your husband ever finds anything in the family, um, oh my goodness, what that would be as a gift. Because we really, we really can't say it didn't happen unless we know it didn't happen. We can only say that the probabilities are very, very low. 
at this point. Yeah, I'm Thank not you. really surprised to find that, but I, and it's so hard to prove a negative. That's um, the problem. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Yeah. Fascinating though. I, I would have liked for it to have been true that somebody could have rescued her if they'd only been that much faster or whatever. Um, and I would just add, oh, go ahead, Nina, if you were going to say something else. No, nothing um, major. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that there were, there were many claims uh, after Marie Antoinette died of people who claimed that they were planning to rescue her. Mm -hmm. So there were plots that we know of, three of them, but then there were all these after the fact. Well, we were, we had a plot. We had a plot all over Europe. People said they had plots. So um, America got into the, into the game with two plots, the Azilum plot and the, uh, and the Wiscasset plot. Sue, so something you said strikes me as, um, Interesting, you had, there's a sense that there was some kind of appropriateness for this plot or this alleged plot to have been located in Maine. And I wonder if you have any sense of what the Maine connection might have meant. Wait, do you mean in the past or then or now or when? Both, actually. Um, but I think the past first, but it's still it's still kicking around. It's it's re, it is a claim to be a big player, you know. Um, and and Wiscasset was a big player in the, in the shipping world. It was a, it was big. It was a port like Falmouth. It was it was probably it may have been a bigger port uh, because so much trade came from through Wiscasset, and so as that waned. Um, this story kind of kept the image and the grandeur of Wiscasset and Maine, I think, in the public eye. So I think that was a big piece of it. Um, and also, I think there's something, Maine is very, is perceived as very rural, right, by people from away. And I think this is a way of saying, you know, we're, we're cosmopolitan, we're urban, not urban, but we're, we're part of the big world and don't you forget it. But I think that gives it, I think that explains some of the sticking power. I think Maine also has a good deal of pride in its Yankee and its English origins. Um, I, I mean, obviously during the period of the Ku Klux Klan, it did not have pride in its French origins because they were the target of the Klan, but, but, um, but a lot of, of Maine demographically was Anglo. Right. right. But I mean, one of the really interesting things about that district, that first district, um, voting Democratic Republican in 1794, this was very atypical for New England to have a to have 64% of the vote go to somebody who was not in John Adams' party at that point. And you know, John Adams was reelect was elected in 1796. Um, the big revolution, and it is called a revolution by historians, the big revolution is called the revolution of 1800, is the Democratic Republic, Re Republican Revolution that elected Thomas Jefferson. And ma the main district voted Democratic Republican in 1800, but that it was already voting that way in 1794, tells me that it wasn't so Anglo identified as you might expect. Uh, given the fact that these were basically English people. Um, I think politics was, you know, pulling, uh, pulling Wiscasset towards France and toward the French Revolution. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other, any other comments or questions? Gilson, do you want to write something in the, in the chat that we can raise or, um, sorry, you don't have a microphone or would anybody else like to Put in a last question. I think Rosie has a question. Rosie. <laughs> Always have questions. Um, would you tell me again how you got interested in this topic? All right. So I was in a secondhand bookstore. I think it was that bookstore oh, okay. in, Port, in, in Portland, right at Free Street and Congress Street. You know that there was a, a used bookstore there, maybe still there. And um, 
I ran into this book. I don't know how I found this book. I must have been looking in French Revolution or some category like that. And I said, oh my God, I have to find out about this plot. Okay. And that's where it started. And I really want to give a shout out, although she's not here on the internet, um, to Janet Carper, who lives in Cornish, Maine, and did this wonderful groundwork that I found in the um, uh, Maine Historical Society archives. Oh. And um, we were in, we, we've been in correspondence a lot, and she read a draft of the art of this, es the essay version of my talk. And um, she has really tried to track down everything she possibly could and well, what, had what, to what, conclude that there was no plot. Oh, yeah. okay. So, but how, like, how did she get into it that she would spend all that time? Um, she's an, she was sort of a, she, she's a, she was a French teacher. Okay. She lives in Cornish and has a house in France and, oh, okay. <laughs> and teaches French. And so she was interested in the French connections to Maine. Okay. And That's heard about this plot. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I certainly appreciate your talk because I just couldn't understand why they would have ever chosen a house in Maine for such a, a plot. But with all the pieces that you brought together, it really makes a lot more sense now that, you know, that they might have considered it maybe a hundred years too late, but. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a plausible idea. Mm -hmm. it's, it's at least as plausible as having, you know, King Louis be a farmer in, Phil in Pennsylvania. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know although, although getting, getting the royal family to, to, to a Zealand would have been, they would have been among, you know, their, their friends. There were loads of people who knew them who emigrated to Pennsylvania. But um, it really, it's a plausible story on one level, but nobody could ever, ever have gotten her out. So in that sense, it's not a plausible story. And these two people probably would not have risked their livelihoods. Certainly Swan, who was underwriting this whole thing. Uh, he was so well placed in France in 1793. Um, why would he take a risk like that? And he was a Republican. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was pretty radical. I love the story that he lived all his last years in prison for a tiny debt because he, that he could easily have paid because he said he didn't owe it and he wouldn't pay it. That's very <laughs> remarkable, really. Mm. He's a character. I wish we knew more about him. If you go to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, visit the room, the James Swan room, where you will see these uh, luxury items, uh, some of which he did bring back on... on on Clough's ship. Mm -hmm. The idea of living in luxury, that, sorry. living in luxury in a debtor's prison. Oh, you could do that. Yeah, it really <laughs> yeah. stretches the imagination. Yeah. I mean, we think of the royal family in prison in the, in the temple, and actually there are lots of engravings, I should have shown you one, of their dining in the temple, and it's quite grand, you know. People, you could live well in prison if you had money. Mm -hmm. And obviously, James Swan did. Well, it's a very different era. And thank you very much, Sue. This is a wonderful talk. And you'll see a lot of people saying that in the chat as well when you have a chance to look at it. Uh, thank you so much for bringing us to this absolutely unusual place. And <laughs> thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope you will come back for Meredith Hall and the annual meeting in June and have a lovely springtime and don't be eaten by the black flies. <laughs> and if anyone discovers anything, send it to me. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.